FBI says they can crack the iPhone on their own. Thank you, smaller, cheaper devices. But do you need to buy them and update your Kindle or else? All that and a whole lot more on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1474, recorded Monday, March 21st, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Right now, get free expedited FedEx shipping when you go to ring.com slash TNT. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100-plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by Igloo Software. Igloo is an intranet you'll actually like. It connects people with the information they need to do their best work. Try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about every single piece of tech news with people who love technology. Yeah, not a morsel is left on the table. Not a morsel is left. Nope. Mm -mm. I am Megan Maroney. And I am at... Jason Howell on Twitter. Why Why the at? I don't know. It's just that kind of day. It's been a crazy day. You're here now. You're not on Twitter. That's right. You're here. You're here now. You don't know. I could be, I could be Twitterizing right now in the background. Uh, big day, eh? You've mm -hmm. kind of been a little busy doing this thing. It was like an Apple announcement or something. Yes, know. we covered it this morning. We recovered it, and now we're going to uncover it and then maybe cover it back up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cover it back up at the end of this show and then move on, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more tomorrow because that's just the way it rolls. Mm -hmm. uh, so in case you hadn't heard, Apple had its big event today. Joining us to talk all about it is Adam Christensen from the MacCast podcast. How's it going, Adam? Uh, great. How are you guys doing? We're doing fantastic. Thanks, uh, yeah. thanks, thanks for coming on to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. One of those big days, you know. I Apple. know. I do know. It's uh, I'm kind of dizzy from it, to be honest. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we had a light wager on last Friday's episode as to whether Apple would address the encryption debate and its involvement with the FBI in the San Bernardino case. Megan, you won. I don't know what I owe you, but I said that Apple would not, and you said that they would. Tib Cook did indeed address this at the top of of the event. So wasted no time, seriously. Yeah, I mean, I think that it would have been weird if he'd ignored it. I mean, that's just not the way he rolls. I mean, I don't think it would have been also equally weird if he used it as a bully pulpit, which yeah. um, I think some people thought he might. He didn't. He just introduced it and, uh, you know, he was, his voice cracked a little bit. I mean, if anyone listens to the show, they know that happens to me sometimes too whenever I'm talking about something that I'm super passionate about. Right. Uh, or you know is super important and yes. you want to get it right and all that kind of right. stuff. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it was great. What did you think, Adam? Um, I thought he, he did a nice job handling it. You know, it wasn't overdone. He didn't. I'm trying to think. I need to go back and rewatch it because I think he just talked generally about encryption in the debate. I don't even think he really got into, you know, the whole fight with the FBI sort of mm -hmm. thing. So I think he kept it really high level and just said, hey, look, here, here is our position. Here's what we think about it. This is why we're involved and so passionate about this and then kind of moved on. Yeah, he said he was humbled. He said he was grateful for all of the support. He said, we need to decide as a nation how much power the government should have over our data and our privacy. It was short and sweet. And then he got on not just to the products that we're going to talk about, but just some, you know, real issues uh, that Apple supports, environmental issues, health issues, things that made us also think about our privacy uh, and, you know, just and Apple's responsibility uh, in, you know, corporate responsibility. So mm -hmm. I thought it was... It was it was short, sweet, and I liked it. I guess I thought the the risk in Tim Cook addressing this, like, during the event was that it might be an actual distraction from the event. But it sounds like from from how you guys kind of interpreted it, it didn't really distract and it just was, was kind of there and moved on. It seemed like it was pretty brief. Yeah, I think it's it's better than what they typically do or have done in the past, which is just running down a bunch of numbers. You know, I'd rather yeah, hear about... Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, maybe not so much the FBI thing, but it was nice to hear the environmental initiatives and then uh, the expansion and focus on some of their health stuff that they've been doing recently. So. Sure. 
Uh, I, I should say, since this is completely related, you know, tomorrow is supposed to be the beginning of the trial. Uh, just breaking right before the show started, the Justice Department actually asked to postpone the court hearing. They're saying that they came into contact with a possible method of accessing the data on the device. They want a little bit of extra time to see if it's successful. And they're saying if it is successful, hey, we don't, Apple, we don't need you anymore. It's cool. We're just moving on, which I kind of find a little strange because it's really seemed partially about getting at the data at this point and partially about potentially setting a precedent, even though they keep saying that it's not. But maybe this is proof that it's actually not. Or maybe it's proof that they don't feel like they have a strong enough case. Well, I think there was there were some grumbles over the weekend, certainly, about how uh, any kind of encryption is not unbreakable. That's not mm -hmm. possible. There was a Johns Hopkins cryptographer who came up right. with a crack for iMessage, which they've been, then they have fixed since uh, if you definitely upgrade to uh, update to 9.3 if you have an iPhone or an iPad, because uh, that is fixed. But just the message there was you can't go dark, and that really smart people that um, hopefully work for the FBI could crack any phone as well as hackers. And by making it easier for hackers, by Apple being charged with making a government OS and making it easier, that's not doing anyone any favors. Mm -hmm. Makes it easier for everyone, I suppose. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about the actual like devices and stuff. <laughs> the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a special day for anyone who has little tiny hands. If you were reluctant to upgrade from your iPhone 5, you can now get all the power of the iPhone 6 in the 4-inch size that you know and love. Uh, the iPhone SE, which we know that this is what it was going to be called. It has an aluminum case, the A9 processor. Uh, it, everyone was kind of waiting and waiting. What's the price going to be? Because, you know, we want to pay less for something that's, that's smaller and is obviously uh, not an upgrade from the 6S that they just announced in the fall. Uh, the 16 gigabyte is $399. Nobody wants that size phone. I mean, I guess there's a couple people that might still find that useful, but... For a really for a decent phone, you're going to pay four ninety nine for it. Um, pre orders start March twenty fourth, and they'll deliver March thirty first. Adam, were you thrilled? Are you happy to see the return to the smaller form factor? I'm actually <laughs> really happy to see this update because I think it's important for Apple from a sales perspective, um, mainly because you have a bunch of people, and I get emails after every one of these events. So when the iPhone success came out, I'll get dozens of emails from people saying, you know, I really just I. I like my 5S, I like my 4-inch form factor, but I want the new technology. I want the A9 processor, I want the latest stuff. And if Apple just had that, I would buy that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of consumers in that space. And then Apple also mentioned during the event that for that, that 5S, they see a lot of people switching over from Android. And I think that's another key market. A lot of people switching over, they want to try iOS, but they maybe they don't want to dive in at, you know, 800 bucks for a phone. So they're looking for that lower price point, something to get them in the door. But again, you kind of feel, you know, it doesn't feel good when you're buying last year's technology or two-year-old technology. So I think this is a really important phone for them in terms of um, maybe not, you know, gaining sales because I think iPhone sales are at a mature point where they're not really going to go up year over year like we have been seeing. But it is going to at least level off the sort of down the little dip that they have in between cycles. And it, it wouldn't surprise me if they continue to keep the, the smaller phone on this release cycle. I don't know if they'll, you know, bring it into the fold later or not, but I, I think it, you know, is the right device sort of at the right time. And, and the features are, I mean, spec wise, it's amazing. So on the outside, it looks like the old one, but I mean, on the inside, it's all new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I've actually always really liked this era of design for Apple. I always thought that the iPhone, that particular era uh, of iPhone uh, design, I don't know, just it, uh, of all the iPhones, it was the one that kind of stuck and, you know, spoke to me, I suppose, more, more so than I think even the latest one. So I suppose it's kind of nice to have the option now and for it to not be a step down for, as far as performance is concerned, that's, that's an even better deal. So yeah, one, one nice change I read about too, just from the design perspective, and this is a really minor thing, but it matters a lot is apparently the chamfered edge is now the matte metal finish rather than that really shiny one that mm. scratches up all the heck. So mm -hmm. Time only tell, but hopefully that'll help minimize on some of the edge damage that you sure. see on a lot of iPhones. Yeah, we discussed this morning that this might be something that uh, businesses use as work phones. Mm -hmm. uh, that and that's what Alex Lindsay said, you know, from Pixel Core said, I will buy five of them, you know, for my employees. And that's an interesting move too, because I think more and more people are thinking like, maybe I do want to separate my work from my, you know, my personal phone. And that, I mean, the personal stuff is why you need the big screen. You know, if you're going to watch something or, you know, 
use FaceTime or the, the kind of things that you think of, the more entertainment stuff is why you need the big phone for just really communicating fast. You don't necessarily need that big screen. Yeah. Like I could think of some ways in which a big screen would be useful in the work work environment, like spreadsheet, you know, that, that kind of stuff. If you're really accessing that on your device, it would be nice to have the bigger real estate as long as they're using the screen, not just blowing things up, but actually giving you more usable space uh, on that larger screen. I could see it. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if, if businesses businesses know that their employees in large numbers do want iPhone, you know, devices, um, if they're being given one through the business, and instead of having to drop eight, nine, a grand on a, on a device for their employees, they can drop something, you know, a lot less and still give them the same amount of power, which it seems like you're getting here. And that's a really... Great yeah. option. Another, one other last thing related to that, because Megan, I think you mentioned the storage sizes. So uh, a lot of people wonder, you know, why does Apple always do that 16 and then they do, you know, do the jump to 64? Why did they keep the 16? Why don't they go to 32? And a lot of that from people I've talked to is about the enterprise as well, mm -hmm. because with a lot of enterprise devices, one, you're buying them in bulk. So you want the lowest price point that you can get. But the other thing is, is a lot of them are under uh, multi-device management through the IT department. So they really don't want you storing a lot of stuff on there anyway. They're going to control which apps generally are going on there. So the storage isn't as big an issue as is the price. Hey, I'm, we're buying 10,000 of these, you know, for our entire workforce. Um, we need the lower price point. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense, too. Just yeah. Not needing to store yeah. that. And Apple makes more money. With, you know, there's more there's more profit margin in that. And they're selling a lot to business. Well, it's good for, for sure. Apple, too. For right. sure. I always assume that they want to just say it's a $400 phone. And that's why they stick yeah. with the, you know. 16 gigabyte, but obviously there's a yeah, bigger for the, reason. Probably that too. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. Or it's not $400. It's $399. There we go. <laughs> Magical. Uh, now, also, as expected, we saw the unveiling of the new 9.7-inch iPad Pro. Same size as the iPad Air 2. $599 is the price on that for the entry-level 32 gig storage version, all the way up to $899 for 256 gigs of storage. And if you want the LTE options, that's going to raise it another eh, around $130 or so. Um, so um, based on what you've seen here, Adam, uh, what improvements have been made with the small, you know, with the smaller iPad Pro compared to the larger predecessor? Like you always think like going down right. in size, you're going to get less features, but this actually has some improved features. There's some new stuff. Yeah, you the, the camera on it is now a 12 megapixel camera, which I, is up from what's in the uh, iPad. I think it's 2.2 aperture rather than the 2.4 um they added the uh led flash on the back the true tone led flash which is the first the first for an ipad um i think the lte is faster I'm trying to quickly go through all, all of the things there might be a few more in there that that i'm not remembering the camera was kind of the, the camera's the kind biggest of the big thing. One, both yeah. both cameras actually the front facing camera um the facetime camera is also a five mega megapixel and I think this one will actually record um, 4K video versus, I think, the iPad Pro 12 inches, 1080p. Yeah, they also uh, talked about the low reflectivity, which is something important. You know, if you are working on it outside, or that's, it's the sure. least reflective device ever. Uh, but yeah. still um, reflective. Oh, yeah, and it has the it has that new uh, color tone thing right. uh, tone. that Phil true talked tone. about for what True Tone, where I guess they've got new ambient light sensors in here that can detect... Um, the color temperature of the room that you're in. So like the light temperature, if I, I would imagine this is sort of like the auto white balance to a certain degree on your camera, right? It's going to detect what's the ambient light around, what temperature is that, and then adjust the screen so that the whites are pure uh, paper white. Yeah, and I, I think a, a big part of this is removing blues uh, so that at night, you know, it is... It, affects your circadian rhythms, as they say, which can actually um, damage, you know, your quality of sleep and all that kind of yeah, stuff. No. So a lot yeah, of apps are doing this in, in some ways. Now they're kind of baking it into the OS. Yeah, the new night shift mode that's right. in uh, the iOS 9.3 update. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's available to anyone who updates. Yeah, I think it's, it, I find myself in a in a weird position because I, uh, I love my iPad Pro. I don't find it too big. It has not replaced my laptop. 
Uh, but, you know, I was telling a lot of people, like, this is a great device for you because you have the pencil and because you have all these features uh, in an iPad, these pro features. And so now I feel like, oh, well, those people might have been better off waiting for the smaller one. Um, you know, but I, it's not my fault. I didn't know they were coming out with this. But No, and it always kind of goes in this direction, too, right? Like, you jump in the very first one, and then you realize later, oh, I like it, but the next one would have been perfect. But you, there's no way that you would have known that a yeah. year ago, you know, or however long. I'm I'm really not tempted by this. I gave up my iPad Air. I had an original iPad Air. I didn't go in for the two um, and went straight to the iPad Pro. And even with some of the new features, I really like the size of the iPad Pro. And to me, it doesn't feel that much bigger day to day to my iPad. The other thing I'd be a little bit worried about with the new 9.7 inch is I really like the, the smart keyboard on my iPad Pro. I use that quite extensively. And I'm just not so sure about the size of that smaller keyboard. I would, I've already read some reviews and people are already commenting. It feels pretty cramped. I mean, you can't do a full size keyboard layout in that size. So yeah, yeah. that that would be a clincher for me. Mm -hmm. um, anytime I I see the like the convertible tablets and, and the keyboard kind of attachment with it, it almost always seems to bring with it a smaller keyboard, and I just cannot get my fingers used to that that type of layout. So yeah, that'd I mean, be no no go for me. Yeah, nothing is perfect, but that, yeah. That's true. <laughs> but I, a lot of people are really going to like it. I yeah. mean, then the 9.7 is ideal for a lot of people, especially with the pencil. I mean, that sure. really puts the, that iPad over the top. Yeah, and I think if people were thinking, oh, that $1,000 for an iPad, that's a little bit too mm -hmm. much. So the high, the most high-end one is $900. That's the biggest one. And it's the biggest size ever of an iPad, I think. Yeah, 256 is mm -hmm. the it's the first Apple iOS device with that much storage. Right. So get yourself a tiny iPhone that has 16 <laughs> gigabytes and then a giant iPad. You're good. Tether them storage. together. Well, you can watch all your, you can load your whole movie library on there. Yeah. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> Uh, well, we talked a little bit already about iOS 9.3. It's available now. I installed it on my iPhone and my iPad. Leo and I walked through all of the new features on iOS today. Um, we also swapped faces, so you will want to watch that. Uh, <laughs> Wait a minute. Is is face swap built into iOS no, now? Oh, sadly. Oh, yeah. oh. Then, then you yet. pay the $900. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of new features. Uh, there's the the bug fix that we mentioned earlier for iMessage, um, and uh, there's you can encrypt notes. That's a really great feature. For, put a password on a note yeah, or whatever. Yeah, that's nice. you can I put like a that. password on a note. And there, you know, there's some things that when you go and read through the release notes, you're like, oh, I always wanted that. And, you know, it was just a little annoying things. Like with Notes, I mean, I use the Notes app to take photos of documents, like personal, you know, driver's licenses, things like that. And then they end up in your photo library, which isn't ideal, you know, mm -hmm. to have those in, in your photo library if you're handing over your, your phone to people. Uh, so now you can decide to encrypt Notes with photos in them. You can decide per note. Uh, and you can also decide that your photos just stay in your Notes as opposed to getting stuck in your photo library. Right. Adam, what do you think about iOS 9.3? Have you downloaded it yet? Yeah, I got it on all my devices. I, I'm excited about some of this stuff. I'm using notes and note, notes more and more, so I really am pretty excited about the encryption thing. To have a built-in way to kind of store and securely store uh, certain items. Uh, in you know, so far I've been using something like One Password's note feature for that sort of thing. But to have it kind of all in there and sync and do everything right built in is going to be nice. Um, I'm not so sure about. I'm going to try the night shift mode. Um, I know a lot of people really swear by it on because they've had it on the Mac for a while. There's a third-party app you can get. Um, so I'll give that a shot and see how it goes. Yeah, but, Flux is uh, is the yeah. big app that I think uh, people use. I, I have it on my on my Android device. I use it um, through an app called uh, Twilight. And yeah, man, I swear by it. Like at night, especially especially if you do any web browsing right before falling asleep, you know, yeah. and it's and it's dark, and all you got is your display. It makes the world of difference. It's so much better on my eyes. Yeah, it'll so. be nice to to go pick up my iPad to check the time and not get last. Yes, out of bed. absolutely. Because <laughs> I've done that before, and with and I have the iPad Pro now, so it's this huge screen, and it's like this giant flood of white mm -hmm. light. <laughs> yep, kind of wakes you up a little bit more, yeah. you, whether you, you want to or not. Mm -hmm. You can also watch podcasts full screen now and music videos, which was you could not do before. You couldn't watch them full screen? You couldn't watch podcasts full screen on the iPad Pro. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, the podcast still. app. I the think, podcast yeah. app, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why not? I know. I don't know. Full that was a thing. That stuff. I think All right. Well, now you can. There's a so lot of good. those things where it's like, why couldn't I do <laughs> yeah, that before? Yeah, that's very strange. I just think of video. 
you know, all those little things that yeah. Apple addressed that I think people are going to like, but probably not really notice. I mean, you're not going to notice a lot of big stuff right off the bat beyond, I think, the notes thing and, uh, you know, the, the new color temperature thing. Yeah. yeah, I think notes is one of those things. I mean, they, there were all these you know, new features and news, too, which I never use. I don't know if you're a big Apple News fan. I'm trying to use it more. I'm trying to use it more. I, I think what I found for with news, I use RSS readers because I have to read a lot of news for what I do. But uh, I'm starting to find it to be the replacement for, like, magazines and the newspaper on Sunday morning. So sit down, pop in there, just kind of get caught up with random things. And the recommendations are getting a little bit better. So I'm exploring news a little bit more. When I first looked at it, I went, ah, I've got RSS readers. Why do I need this? Mm -hmm. But for just, like, random browsing, I think it's good. I feel like new notes is, I want news to be where notes is now. Like, that's what we thought about notes, you know, a year or two ago. Right. It's like, I have so many notes apps that do better things than, uh, than you know, the notes app. And But now that's not the case. So hopefully that will be the case with Apple News. It'll catch right. up. Right. They opened it, they just opened it up to um, last week, I think, to more uh, mm -hmm. blogs and, and people to submit content. So I think as more content gets in there, I also think they've got a lot of tools for people who want to build content that's really formatted for the news app. And as more and more people do that, I think it's going to become more, a more valuable resource as well. All right. Now, we did hear uh, that the Apple Watch announcements might be limited to just like more bands. And that's pretty, pretty fair, pretty accurate. Black Milanese, more leather bands, expanded colors in the Flowlastomer, Flow, Flowlastomer, Flower, Flowlastomer <laughs> bands, and a throwback style woven nylon series. But beyond that, the Apple Watch sees a price drop to $299 from $349. Um, now, Adam, does a price drop in the Apple Watch less than a year from its kind of its initial release, does that indicate anything about how it's selling, do you think? Or is this pretty much par for the course? No. I, I mean, I think it's, I think it makes a lot of sense. Again, you're going to have your early adopters. And Apple's done this uh, with other products in the yeah. past. If you go back and look at the original iPhone got, what, a $100 price drop or something mm -hmm. within the first couple of weeks. But I think that was more of a, Apple saying we made a mistake. Here, what we're seeing, I think, is they've gotten through the holidays. They've had good sales. I mean, it's the number one selling watch. I, wa I want to say it's like 75% of the smartwatch market. I don't have the latest numbers in front of me. But um, I think the price drop just, again, helps carry it through, you know, later in the cycle. And, you know, people who are maybe on the fence, hey, it's $50 less now a uh, little bit easier to get in on and you got some new design choices. So, mm -hmm. and I, I bet that Apple's also betting that some people might take that $50 savings and put it right into buying a second band. Yeah, probably. Hopefully. Yeah. The only <laughs> other uh, mention of the watch was really during the, the discussion of uh, health, which we really haven't covered. But Care Kit was another thing mm -hmm. that they announced, uh, which will start in April. And that was really about using your data uh, more smartly, like letting uh, doctors use it. And they the watch was featured in a lot of videos talking about that, which I thought was interesting. We've talked on this show about how, you know, we track ourselves constantly, but what do we do with it? And that was kind of one idea of what what we might do with it. I, I sort of hoped there would be bands that might have some other additional health features built into them, uh, like we saw last like, week, yeah, the, like the Alive Core mm -hmm. band mm -hmm. uh, that was a EKG and like an FDA-approved device, uh, but we didn't see that. Yeah. I, I think that FDA approval is one of those things that Apple is saving some features for maybe Apple Watch 2. You know, if it's going to have to go through the FDA, there's a whole process there. And um, right now they're kind of relying on third parties to do a lot of that work. But I, I fully expect there'll be a bunch of new sensors whenever we get Apple Watch 2. And who knows when that's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a big differentiator, too. Uh, for, for Apple to have that FDA clearance. Mm -hmm. Well, you can update your Apple TV today, too. Siri works better, especially for entering passwords. You can now like, say special characters, and it knows what you're talking about. So anyone who's tried to enter their password into an Apple TV with a <laughs> remote, it's just, it's so, it was so arduous. Uh, a lot of sweating involved and just really frustrating. But now, I mean, Leo tried it today. You can enter, you know, like question mark or pound sign or whatever it is, whatever special characters you so use. So wait a minute, you're saying your password out loud? I'm saying Leo's password out loud. So. Oh, okay. Right. I guess you're in your All living right. room, but still. You're saying your password out loud. You're saying it to Siri. You're in your living room. Yeah, yeah. I know. Um, but, yeah, you, know, you can put apps in folders now on your Apple TV. There's a new podcast okay. app on the Apple TV also. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yes. sizable update, do you think? I mean, yeah, I, yeah, the Apple TV one, I, I like a lot. Um, the folders, I mean, they work like iOS folders. I was kind of hoping Apple would have done something a little more innovative, um, that 
better work the TV interface. Like I was kind of hoping maybe for like more like tabs where I could just have separate, you know, categorized screens, but folders will do for now. Um, but the dictation stuff, I tried that out and I was immediately impressed by it because when I wanted to create my folders, I'm like, I don't want to type in the name of the folder. So I used it just for the folder names. And I was surprised at how fast it was. I, mm. I barely finished saying it and it was boom, it was on there. Um, so I don't know how they're, how they're running that technology. If it's still going out to the internet, I would assume and coming back. Um, but also uh, another place that dictation really comes in handy is search in apps that don't have Siri search enabled yet. Mm. So YouTube, for example, I tried it out in YouTube and rather than having to, you know, click back and forth across that long thing to type in your search, you just pull the Siri button, say what you want to find and boom, you got a search back. So I think that's kind of a game changer. There, there is nothing more miserable than sitting on the couch trying to enter 20 characters with your little directional remote pointed yeah. at the TV. It is so, oh, man. Uh, yeah. So that's good. That's that's actually a pretty huge usability improvement uh, for Apple yeah. TV. Excellent. Um, that's kind of the announcement. Any any kind of final thoughts? You, were you pretty happy with what you saw? Were you missing anything? What do you think? Yeah. No. I I was I was happy with what I saw. I mean, I think a lot of it was what was expected. If you were yeah. following Apple leading up to this, we kind of got exactly what the rumor sites were saying. I think uh, something that's kind of fallen out afterwards that's frustrating me a little bit is a lot of people seem to be disappointed by these announcements. And I think there's still some really significant, you know, new products in here for certain segments of the market. I think a lot of the reaction that's coming back is because people in the tech community, you know, this wasn't a big, huge, there's not a lot of innovative stuff here. There's a lot of iterative stuff, mm -hmm. like a lot of nice improvements, a new product that's going to kind of, you know, complete the iPhone lineup and help with sales a little bit. It was a lot of it was just, you know, stuff that needed to happen. And, but I still think there's some cool tech in here. I mean, there's some cool updates for those people who are looking for those kinds of products who wanted a four inch phone, who wanted a more powerful 9.7 and was disappointed that Apple didn't do an iPad Air 3. Well, here's a product for you now. So uh, I'm pretty excited. I think this, this is a good solid set of announcements for Apple and some nice updates to uh, the OSs. I feel like what you're talking about is like, a, is a greater kind of like the tech Tech community, tech aficionados at large are guilty of that, not just with Apple announcements, but with technology right. in general, because we've been so used to these giant leaps, you know, for, for years. And in the last couple of years, things have kind of slowed down and they've kind of, you know, it's, it's almost like all devices have reached a sort of parity. So you kind of know what to expect. They're filling in the holes that the other ones had maybe and, and all that kind of stuff. All it, all it leads to is a better device. So yes, while it doesn't look like a spaceship or something we couldn't possibly imagine going into it and we're amazed for that very reason right there, it's still making better devices. Um, yeah, I completely agree. It would be crazy if they released a phone that was an that upgrade looked like from a spaceship. the spaceship. Oh. <laughs> that looked like a spaceship or that was an upgrade from the success. I mean, that would be insane. Yeah, uh, right. And I think they were they were kind of saying that a little bit with their environmental piece. We didn't talk about Liam, the mm. iPhone recycling oh, yeah, robot. But who I love because <laughs> I love robots. Uh, but that was fascinating. I mean, talking about really, um, you know, using the parts of the iPhone uh, in different ways. Like you can use the silver in, in solar yeah. panels. And just the idea that there's a robot that's able to take apart these devices that have a lot of poisonous chemicals in them and turn them into something else. Uh, there's Liam now. Oh, hi, Liam. Video Hello, version. Liam. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think... I don't know. We get on this this crazy. I thought this was a good answer to last year's hype around the iPhone Forever, or the you know iPhone every year um, mm -hmm. push, which I am not a huge fan of. I just don't think we need to upgrade that fast. Yep. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. There we go. And thank you, Liam, for showing us how you destroy iPhones on a daily <laughs> basis. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us, Adam Christensen. It's a real pleasure getting you on the show and getting your perspective on all the Apple stuff. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of where people can follow all of your work online. You're doing a lot of things. Sure, yeah. I do a podcast uh, called The MacCast, all about Apple and Mac. Uh, news, we try and do tech help, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I also do a show called the iOS show. So that's a little bit more focused on iOS. It's a round table with two guys, um, Michael Johnston and Jeff Gamut. You can find that at the iOS show.com. Uh, MacCast, of course, is at MacCast.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at MacCast. Awesome. Adam, thank you so much. Have a have a great day and have fun with your new device devices <laughs> if you order them, if and when you get them. Well, thank you. Take All right. care.
Take care. Bye. <laughs> All right, so coming up, yes, there's news that doesn't involve Apple, so we'll check in on a few of those other things. But first, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode, the Ring Video Doorbell. Got one of those doorbells right here, in fact. I've got this sucker uh, installed at my house, at my front door, and, you know, people ring it. I, I see who's standing there. Maybe a package is being delivered. Maybe... You know, we had some friends come over for dinner the other night, so maybe that's happening. It also, and thankfully this hasn't happened to me yet, but sometimes when people ring your doorbell, it's the sound of someone who's planning to rob you. Over 95% of home break-ins happen during the day. Burglars almost always start by ringing the doorbell because they want to see if you're home before they kind of go in and take all your things. With the Ring Video Doorbell, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. Ring's advanced motion detection actually alerts you even if someone doesn't ring the doorbell. So they decide not to ring, you'll still get a notification. With Ring Video Doorbell, you can talk to the delivery people that stop by. You can keep an eye on the package that they dropped off, make sure it stays there. Someone tries to mess with it. You'll get an instant alert, HD video of the entire thing. You can yell at them, maybe, if you catch them in the act. It's like having a neighbor keep an eye on your home 24-7. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had this installed for months. It was super easy to install at our front door. And, you know, I mean, I think I've talked about it plenty of times on this show, but my kids love to uh, love it because they know that if they push the button, uh, I might actually answer. And, uh, you know, we don't have kind of the wiring, so it's we're running off of the built-in uh, rechargeable battery, and you just charge it up. Pretty awesome. Uh, Ring actually has a new uh, advanced Ring video doorbell that they're selling as well, which is pretty awesome. It's two forty nine. dollars Starts shipping late April, and uh, very cool stuff. Some extra bonus features. Definitely want to check that out if you go to the Ring site. Uh, and kind of now you have options. Put your mind at ease and protect your home with the video doorbell, Time Magazine, and USA Today named one of their top 10 gadgets. Go to ring.com slash TNT for free expedited FedEx shipping. That's ring.com slash TNT. With Ring, you're always home. All right, so a few of the other news things that aren't Apple. <laughs> uh, 10 years ago today, Jack Dorsey, Twitter's CEO, took the site that he helped create and entered the very first update. He said, just setting up my Twitter, uh, which at that time Twitter had no vowels. It was kind of a big deal in the world of the internet startups mm -hmm. at that point. So it was T-W-T-T-R. So there you go. What do you think about this, Megan? Ten years? I, I actually signed up for Twitter in 2008, uh, and I, I didn't say anything mm -hmm. for many years. I just, I didn't understand it. I didn't like it. So you signed I, up. I got signed your up user in 2000. ID, but you know, you it proves it. You yeah. know, you can say it says user since 2008. But I had, I was making a stance that I was going to not say anything forever. And then I didn't tweet really. I actually had some tweets. Uh -huh. My Twitter got hacked and I got spammed where there were people like just posting random. Have, did, did that happen to you with the like spam bots where it says like, yeah. I'm just getting a latte in my minivan, like things I might have said, oh, wow. but things that I really didn't say. And it was like a link to an ad. Uh -huh. So then I deleted it all. And I, I came back strong right before I started uh, this job in, in 2014. And uh, I love it now more than <laughs> More than life things. itself. More, okay, not maybe more not, than life maybe itself, not but more much. than most things. Um, yeah, I think what, what's interesting to me, so I took a look back on mine. My first tweet was May 30th, 2007, and it was pretty standard. It was, signed up for Twitter. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. And, like, I remember that Twitter then versus Twitter now, I feel like they're kind of two different things. Back then, the question was, what are you doing? And so right. all of the tweets seemed to be like, I'm doing this, or at the cafe ordering a sandwich or blah, blah, blah. And just kind of seems so, I don't know, I, I hate to hate to say meaningless because it really was just kind of like, oh, I don't know, I'm going over there and it seems so banal to a certain degree. Um, whereas now Twitter has become you know, kind of evolved into this like shared conversation, which is, I mean, uh, Ev would probably be stoked to hear us call it a conversation because that's kind of what they're referring to it as. Um, you know, it's kind of a big place for kind of live uh, live things to happen at the same time and people to connect, like earthquakes, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, when an earthquake happens, you know, you hop online, you check out your Twitter feed, and you see all these other people that are experiencing it at the same time as you, uh, kind of shared experiences. And that's a big part of what Twitter has become over the years. But uh, 10 years, which is kind of weird. I, it feels weird to think that it's been around 10 years, even though I've used it almost as long 
Uh, it doesn't seem like it's been around that long. Yeah, I mean, it's it's slightly younger than Twit itself. So you remember that whole thing where there oh, that's was, right. like, the yes. confusion between Twit <laughs> yeah. and Twitter. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I do. I the, the way I found out about Twitter was uh, Leo interviewing Ev on Twit, uh, or one of the shows. I'm assuming it was Twit. Uh, but yeah, that's and I was like, that sounds weird. Like, why would you name something that sounded just like Twit? And also, uh, <laughs> why would you have something that you, someone could use to stalk you? Like, that was my biggest oh, issue. Okay. With it. It's like, why say everywhere you're going? Like, don't you care about your own you know, privacy? Right. But back, it was a different world back then. It was a different age. It yes. was a different age. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so Jack Dorsey uh, had a Q and A with Bloomberg. I thought there were some a few kind of in celebration of the ten years. Some interesting points. Uh, it says that Jack sees Twitter as, a, as is seen as a way to update about something. For many people, you know, like I was saying, it's more about tuning into an event in real time, that it's more passive to start. And this is a big challenge that Twitter has right now, right? Like getting new people to use it. People sign up for Twitter and they don't know how to use it. Do I go on and do I post, but I've got nobody following me, so does it matter? And it really seemed like what Ev was saying is kind of the way people kind of get hooked on Twitter is that they sign up and they tune into kind of the vein of live that surrounds them. And as they kind of get accustomed to that over time, they kind of go out on a limb and start to update and everything like that. And I don't know how that works long term, but uh, I think that's pretty pretty accurate. It seems that's that's how you kind of get bit by the Twitter bug. So there you go. So 10 years from now, we might be talking not about Twitter, but Matter. Uh, M-T-T-R, -M because yeah. they'll remove the <laughs> Right, they will go back the to the vowels. No vowels. Yeah. So Medium has now spun off their in-house publishing arm, Matter, into a new company run by blogger and Twitter co-founder, who we just were speaking of, Ev Williams. It's not a website, but what is it? I'm not sure. They will offer creators support, uh, both creative and financial support, to create, quote, different media products under their own brands from multi-platform digital journalism to podcasts and books to live events to streaming film, TV, and video to new things we haven't even thought of, end quote. So this is interesting. I mean, we've talked a lot about Medium and what their place is. Like, they don't really have a an editorial board. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it's you know, is it, a, is it a magazine? Is it what? So I think that Matter seems to be a little uh, more, uh, more of an edit. It has, will have more of an editorial more voice. Editorial, they, have, yeah. they have an editor, uh, Hillary Fry from Fusion. She is a huge and beloved editorial leader. So she'll, she'll be uh, running it from an editorial perspective. So I, I like that because I'm not a huge fan of Medium because I don't know where they come from. Um, so Matter is something that seems interesting. I mean, it's not, it, I think basically it's the creation, it's the content, it's not the medium it comes across, not to, no pun intended. <laughs> Although I like it. Uh, yeah, Matter seems like one of, those, one of those examples of why medium exists and why people are drawn to it, you know, creating content using that platform. And it actually has been pretty darn successful. Uh, it won a National Magazine Award uh, with a piece that was, was, uh, was done through Matter. And, uh, yeah, they want it to be, they say, digital for digital storytellers, uh, to two digital storytellers, what HBO and Amazon Studios are for TV makers, you know, people that create content for TV and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know. It kind of seems like a shining example of kind of why medium exists and what you can do with the medium platform. Now it's kind of uh, branching out. Yeah, I mean, they have Bill Simmons is now part of Medium. His his website, which I think will be run by his own editorial team, mm -hmm. is part of Medium. So I think the bigger creators. Um, Stephen Levy of Back Channel, he already has uh, a place on Medium. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to to knowing more where the content comes from. So sure. it's easier to tell the difference between a press release and <laughs> journalism. And an Amazon uh, PR battle that for some reason takes place on Medium and all that yes. kind of stuff. Uh, hey, if you've ever watched Futurama and you thought to yourself, man, if I only had the raw talent as well as the technical tools to make something like this, I would totally do it. Well, a part of your wish has come true. Now you just need to work on the talent. Toons is the software that was used to produce Futurama as well as classic movies. Uh, Princess Mononoke was one. Uh, that, that's definitely a great movie. You should check that out. Uh, a free open source version of Toons is now available to the public. It's called Open Toons. The company behind its release, Digital Video, says it's aiming to make the 2D animation world standard, make it the standard for all this kind of stuff. Basically, you can do some really powerful things to, with it. You can take a single drawing, turn it into an animated sequence. Um, you know, all the tools are included. You can scan a drawing on paper, uh, convert that into vector-based drawings for animation, you know, compositing, rendering, all that kind of stuff. So you can, you can create cartoons, essentially, with this free tool. And it just kind of 
I, I love that this kind of stuff is happening. It's like the, the sheer access that people have nowadays to free tools to do some really crazy things. Like 15, 20 years ago, it was not this easy. Mm-hmm. You know, I see it a lot in the music production space, what, what you can get for next to nothing and the, the power that you have in comparison with what you needed 20 years to do that. Now you can create, well, okay, you can't create Futurama, but they did with this. And so, you know, use your imagination. You can do some really cool stuff if you learn this tool. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Princess Mononoke. Mm-hmm. Great uh, first PG-13 movie for kids. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to remember that. I've got a few years to go, but yeah. yes, I'll remember that. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think the free tools, you still have to have some talent, but the tools yeah. make it easier. Absolutely. So if you have an old Kindle and you want to continue using it, you need to connect it to the internet. If you want to, you can use it for as long as you want, but if you want to connect it to the internet, you have to listen to this. Amazon is giving its users until tomorrow to update their old devices with an emergency update. Oh, no. I have a Kindle somewhere. I have no idea where it is, and I can't update it because I'm not sure where it is, so I guess I'll never be able to read a book again. No, not true, Megan. <laughs> Once you find it, you'll be able to do a manual update. I could also read you a connect... regular book. What's that? I also The reason why I can't find it is because I read regular books oh, made of so trees. The, so the can- Kindle didn't didn't sing to your heart? It never, but it was an original Kindle, okay. um, and it didn't sing to my heart. It did not spark <laughs> joy, and so it's hidden. I mean, it, it is somewhere, and so yeah. they do say there is... It isn't really a brick if I don't update it tomorrow. There's right. a workaround that yeah. you can do. Yeah, you'll be able to manually update it at some point down the line. But they're saying if you have it and you can connect it to the Wi-Fi, it'll actually update. And then you'll still be able to, you know, read books on it and connect to the Internet, which is kind of important. They don't really say what the emergency update is all about. They just say emergency update. So there you go. Don't, well, it's uh, good to update your devices that connect I to the Internet. So. <laughs> I suppose so. But maybe you're that... not using it anymore. These are actually kind of older devices, right? It's uh, Yeah, the paper is, white and The paper before. white and before. Yeah. So, I mean, they only really connected to the Internet to get a book. Mm-hmm. Like, that was what they did. Um, but other than that, you didn't, you know, surf the Internet on it or anything. Right. These old ones. Right. But, yeah, do you, you don't have a Kindle? No. Do you read and books it, on tablets? I listen to them, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. I do the I do the audiobook thing, like... I just, I could never really get into reading on my tablet, reading books, but I read tons of articles, dang it. (laughs) I have to for this job. Well, up next, we'll find out why our constant need to update our devices is no laughing matter. But first, let's take a minute to thank ZipRecruiter. I love my job. Really, where else could I spend the day checking out face swapping apps and talking to my TV (laughs) remote, which is most of what I did today? That's true. But I did not just walk off the street and get this job. Maybe I did walk off the street and get this particular job right here. But before I had this job, I had to convince a lot of other people to hire me first in order to be qualified for my current career. Whichever side of the hiring process you're on, the process can be brutal, brutal, but it doesn't have to be. ZipRecruiter takes the stress out of finding a job and out of finding the right people to work for you. Posting jobs in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. Short staffing leaves little time to post to dozens of job sites. Thanks to ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites with one single click and be instantly matched to candidates. You can search over 12 million resumes with thousands of new resumes added every day. It's free to search and plans include full content information from 50 to 1,000 resumes per month, depending on plan type. Just post once, and within 24 hours, you can watch your candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. Your job ad should look good, too. ZipRecruiter lets you start with mobile optimized pages that look great on any screen. You get more visitors to your jobs and more applicants. ZipRecruiter has been used by over 800,000 businesses, and you can try it now for free. Scott, a happy ZipRecruiter client, said the recruiting process used to be so painful before I'd post to several places, get a million resumes, but only a few responses from qualified candidates. It was torture. But with ZipRecruiter, we post once and get qualified candidates in one easy-to-review place. We've hired some of our best employees using ZipRecruiter. Thank you, Scott. Today, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. All right. So, yes, we're back with an Apple story. But this one's a little different. Joining us now is Selena Larson from The Daily Dot. How's it going? Doing well. How are you guys doing today? Doing awesome. Uh, We've got some Apple stuff to talk about here. During Apple's announcement this morning, something that uh, Phil Schiller, not Phil Schiller, uh, said on stage, lit the social networks ablaze. First, what exactly did Phil say on stage that upset so many people in the Twitter sphere and beyond? 
Yeah, so Schiller was kind of giving the rundown of the new iPad Pro, the PC replacement that, you know, is kind of, it's supposed to be amazing and wonderful and great. Uh, he was given some digs at Windows, you know, as uh, one tends to do. And he said that 600 million people are using PCs that are over five years old. And then he followed that up by saying, this is really sad. So <laughs> it was a bit of an insult and it's I, I i'm assuming that it was just a very very poorly planned joke um kind of like a subtle dig at um at windows users but it was very condescending and offensive uh the way that it came off and understandably it uh, upset a lot of people who were uh, watching it on the live stream and and on twitter um unfortunately a lot of the members of the audience clapped kind of just underscoring the sort of um lack of self-awareness that was happening both on stage and in the audience uh so yeah that's that that was what went down this afternoon i thought when he said you know those people are coming from using windows P pcs i was convinced it was going to be some upgrade to microsoft office that you can use on the ipad you know so i wouldn't have to be using google docs and i thought that it would be something like that and i was really surprised i was like oh he's just i get what he was saying but yeah it was very tone deaf and mm. and the people in the room are you know are all the insiders uh so it wasn't really surprising to me that they clapped um i think maybe they were expecting something more microsoft related too because they said most of them are windows pcs i think the point he was trying to make was that some people don't need a pc at all like they can just use an ipad do you think that's what he was trying to say I'm honestly not super clear as to what he was trying to say. Uh, that it was, I, I mean, I think it was just something that landed really poorly. Uh, and what I find kind of interesting, and I just tweeted this earlier, uh, is that somebody pointed this out that uh, a handful of Apple execs, including at a Q, sort of face palmed uh, right when Phil Schiller made that uh, comment. So uh, it, it, uh, you can see it in the in the in the live stream and and uh, the video that's up right now. Um, that after, as soon as he said that, there were a, a few uh, execs in the audience that realized the mistake. And it was doubly confusing, especially when uh, earlier Apple really lauded all of their green efforts and right. all the ways that you can recycle things and um, how they make products to last for a long time. Uh, so right 20 minutes before uh, Schiller got on stage, they're like, oh, this is great. You can use Apple products for a long time. Then we're going to have this like weird robot that's going to come in and recycle them. Them. And then he's like, oh, some people are still using PCs that are five years old. What duds? <laughs> uh, so it was a little bit of, it was a little bit of like a, an odd juxtaposition there yeah. and people got a little bit offended. Yeah. Like when I think of Apple presentations, I think that they have, you know, a team, teams of people that are pouring over these presentations prior. And so it actually makes me wonder if he just kind of went off the script a little bit and just decided to, you know, make it make an off the cuff kind of joke about it. And as we know, sometimes off the cuff can get you into big trouble because, <laughs> yes. you, because you know, it, sometimes you hear these things in your head and they take on a different meaning than when you suddenly say it out loud and you realize, I know I've been there. I know I've, I've said the wrong thing. And as the words, you can literally see those words coming out of your mouth. And as you see them, you try and bring them back, but it's too late. And it, you know, so I, yeah, I, I wonder if it was even part of the script at all. Um, yeah, it's really unfortunate. Yeah, I'd be really surprised if it was. I mean, you might be right. It was kind of just like an off-the-cuff remark. Um, but again, I mean, it's just kind of underscoring this sort of lack of self-awareness, this this joke of, of kind of throwing people under the bus here. Oh, well, if you're not you know, able to afford or you can't uh, keep up with the latest tech and gadgets and things. And right. it's just like, oh, you're just sorry. You're not as good as we are kind of thing. It was a, li a little bit of a, the Apple privilege was showing. Sure. And I mean, we've been talking for a month now about uh, the government and privacy and how Apple is really concerned uh, with our privacy and our all the personal data that we keep on our iPhones. Uh, but it's becoming more and more clear that that is a luxury item. Um, even, you know, even this smaller, cheaper iPhone they released today is still going to cost you $600. Uh, so, you know, the, it, it is interesting because we talk, we talk about this a lot, but like, what if they're saying is they really care about their customers, not like, you know, the people as mm -hmm. in what the government is supposed guess, to do. I, yeah. I mean, I guess Apple is a business and they make money off the people. So, uh, as long as they're making money, I'm sure they're happy. Now, this wasn't the only barb against Microsoft. Later in the keynote, the iPad Pro was compared pretty favorably against Microsoft's Xbox 360 console. Um, 
why do you think Apple's looking to? It kind of seems like they're looking to like respark this, you know, this this years long debate of Apple versus PC. Do you think this is kind of like an active uh, approach that that they're targeting at this point? I mean, I think it's kind of just this ongoing thing. And uh, if you caught it in the beginning, they did the 40 years and 40 seconds thing. And um, Mac versus Windows was one of the slides. They they had uh, it was kind of you know sort of woven in throughout this Mac versus PC, Mac versus Windows, uh, you know, kind of fight that they've got going on. So I think, I mean, the rivalry is, the rivalry is still there. Um, it, it showed itself in a couple of bad uh, dad jokes. Um, but <laughs> You're always guaranteed to get a couple of bad dad jokes at an Apple event, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but again, I mean, I think, I just think it's sort of this ongoing rivalry and, and uh, it's something that I'm sure we can expect to see in the future events. Uh, well, I can say that I have a desktop that's six years old. It happens to be a Mac Pro. So I don't know if, like, I, I don't know where that sits because it's kind of the same point, right? right. Like, I've got my well, Mac Pro and I'm not getting rid of that thing. It's perfectly sufficient. Like, should I feel bad about that? No, I think the argument is that, I mean, the argument has always been that if you want to get a cheaper laptop, it's going to be a Windows laptop. Like, yeah. you're going to have to pay more money for an Apple laptop. So I right. think, and again, I think the argument was Maybe you don't need a laptop. Maybe all you need, you can do on an iPad Pro, right. and you can pay $600 for it. That would be the same price that you would pay to maybe buy a new Windows laptop. Got it. You know, so mm -hmm. I think that is the point he was trying to make. And then the okay. point that I've made, too. Like, I think, you know, you don't necessarily, everybody doesn't need the processing power of a PC or a MacBook or anything. You know, maybe you, you do, most of what you do is email and browsing and and you don't work on it, then you, you probably will be fine with an iPad. Sure. I think that's the argument but that they meant to make. But I <laughs> definitely think that that, uh, you know, it's to say it's for. sad that people are using uh, a laptop that's, you know, five years old. It's, you know, it's sad lots of people don't have laptops. You know, some people mm -hmm. don't have clean water. So, yeah, I mean. Sure, sure, sure. Um, cool. Well, Selena, uh, thank you so much for coming on to kind of talk about this. Uh, Selena Larson is at The Daily Dot. Where can people kind of follow all the stuff you're doing over there? Yeah. So if you want to just head over to the tech section at The Daily Dot, that is where I can be found. Also, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I'm just at Selena Larson. Fantastic. Thank you, Selena. Have a great day. Thanks. Yeah, we'll thanks, guys. Take it easy. Yeah, we'll talk to her next week. Or oh, that's right. She's, she's on next week. Yes. On. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But now it's time to talk about TNT's fan of the day is Brian Guype at Guype Brian on Twitter, who says, Happy belated pie day. And yes, I watched Know How to hashtag raspberry pie. Obviously, a maker is in our list. Yeah, mix. look at it. There we go. Got a whole maker set up there. He does. Nice. And something to clean it with in a spray bottle. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe to We're going to analyze plant. everything on your desk. <laughs> you know, if you show me a picture of your desk, I yeah, am totally I going to analyze it. Totally. Uh, but let don't let that keep you from <laughs> telling us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we will find it. All right. Up next, we're going to talk a little bit about Facebook and kind of some of its analysis around uh, families and career paths, some interesting data there. But first, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode, and that's Igloo Software. Anyone that's worked in a corporate environment knows how painful legacy intranets can be. The content, it's stale. The interface, it's ugly. You can only access it while you're at work. Igloo is an intranet that you'll actually like. It's a cloud platform and uh, allows you to do a lot of things. You can share files, collaborate on documents, blog updates, coordinate calendars, manage projects. It's built using responsive design, which basically means everything you can do at your desk, you can now do on the go through any web browser. And anyone can add content based on their permissions with drag and drop widgets, as well as a WYSIWYG editor. Igloo also offers a bunch of access uh, options, authentication, identity services, to ensure that only authorized users actually have access. It's private clouds over SSL with 256-bit encryption. Now, unlike other solutions, you can customize Igloo to fit your needs and work with your current IT investments like Salesforce, SharePoint, Active Directory, and coming soon, file sharing solutions like Box and Dropbox. It's great for growing companies and larger enterprises looking to refresh their communication strategy. It's used by government agencies, as well as companies like Hulu, Inventive Health, American Family Insurance, and Ipswich. Try it for free uh, for yourself. Go to igloosoftware.com slash twit 
or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. And when you sign up through our link, you can get your own igloo for up to 10 people absolutely free for as long as you want. It's igloosoftware.com slash T-W-I-T. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, so Facebook uh, published the results of a study that it ran on its users involving how family can affect its users' career paths. 5.6 million users were analyzed to find out how influential that link can be. This just kind of reminded me of, like, I feel like over the last 100 years, like, you heard a lot of this, right? Like, my dad is a doctor, so I'm following in his footsteps, and I'm becoming a doctor. Well, this study kind of found some very interesting things. It found that the absolute percentage of children following the career path of their parents is quite low nowadays. The son of a father in legal profession, let's say, is 4.6 times more likely to practice medicine based on their data. Uh, of mothers who work in an office or an admin kind of scenario, daughters were only two times more likely to follow compared to the normal rate. So it's more, but it's not like drastically more. 15% of siblings actually share the same career. Uh, which is only two times the normal rate, so a little bit, you know, double the boost at there as, as well. Uh, you might find this interesting. Twins are 24.7% likely to share the same career, um, you know, over just the standard, like, 7% of, of anyone, let's say. So overall, vast majority seems to kind of make their choices on their own. But this is, you know, this is just another example of kind of, kind of, Big data, essentially. You know, Facebook has all this data on their users, and you can find some very interesting kind of inferences out of that. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this was on Facebook's blog, so it's interesting that I think they're they're using this to sort of counter. Hey, we don't just use all the free information you're giving us to to target with ads. We have something useful to provide you as well. Uh, and I do think that's interesting because you know it's hard to do testing. We we talked about this. Uh, with the drunk tweeting story, that was what that was about. Like they analyzed all these tweets to figure out like where people were drinking and what they were doing mm -hmm. when they were drinking. And you know, it was it was an interesting way to study behavior, easier, cheaper, faster way. And this is mm -hmm. again also an easier, cheaper, faster way. I mean, to me, it's like I know it's a lot of data, but also like what about the people whose family isn't on Facebook? You know, oh, sure, how do, what, sure. what does that have to do with the data? Or you know, what about people who don't work and um, yeah, this was English speaking mm -hmm. people, but yeah, it was, it was fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we got. It was fascinating. It was, no, it's true. I, I'm I mean, sorry. at a certain point. Fascinating was, I was just lying. It was mildly interesting. <laughs> I was totally, I need to come clean study. here. No. It was, it was mildly interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's more interesting to me that they have all this data and they're and that constantly they can do using any, it yeah, and that they're sort of use, they're trying to say like throw us a bone like here's something you might find mildly sure. interesting <laughs> while we're targeting I, you with advertising on all the information that you're constantly giving us me included yep we're all we're all kind of feeding into that mm -hmm. uh all right well uh moving on from that mildly interesting story I agree, by the way. Uh, tomorrow's guest will be the not mildly interesting, totally awesome and always interesting. But we're not allowed to say interesting. She's the one that told us not to say interesting. She's going to slap us every time we say really? interesting. Really? Yes. Becky Worley, don't say interesting on podcasts anymore. <laughs> we'll have to name the, the show something with interesting in it just to teach me not to say it again. <laughs> we'll see how that works. But Becky Worley will be on tomorrow. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can always be a part of the show by emailing us at TNT and at twit.tv. And I hope that you do. Send us an email. Tell us what you thought of the Apple announcement today or any of the other stuff we talked about. You can also leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. And you can find us on Twitter. We are at Tech News Today TV. And this is the part of the show where I like to thank everyone for listening all the way through. Don't forget all the ways you can watch or listen to our show. iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Amazon Echo, YouTube, Facebook, even on the internet, on your five-year-old laptop or even or older than that. Laptop, yeah. Your 10-year-old laptop. Mm -hmm. You can also subscribe to our show. That is the best way to get it and the quickest way at twit.tv slash TNT. You can find me on Twitter. I am at Megan Maroney. And once again, I am at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Anthony Nielsen, and all the folks who help us produce this show every single day. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Ow. <laughs>